welcome to Rise and Shine. I'm Shelby Barrett, the Stone Up for the Stone Roadie Show, and it's time to wake and bake with Craig Reed and Griff Martin. When we get up in the morning, along with coffee, toast, and cake, if you're like the old Stone Roadie, you like to wake and bake. Now let's join Craig Reed and Griff Martin as we head out. It's a wake and bake morning show. It's a wake and bake morning show. It's a wake and bake morning show. Good morning. Podcast number 148 action. All righty then, looky here, looky here, and good morning, fellow earthlings. Yes, it is podcast number 148 of the Stone Roadie Show, and it's uh, episode number 31 of the Wake and Bake Morning Buzz, and my name is Craig Reed, a.k.a. the Stone Roadie, and this is my co-host, the rocket scientist, Griff Martin. Uh, Craig, we got a lot of interesting stuff going on here at, uh, that we can talk about. We got a bunch of comments and uh, on the last one, uh, probably mo more comments than we've ever gotten in the past. Uh, I guess people are liking us going over some of the comments, so we'll continue to do that. And um, yeah, I got a uh, I got a couple of a couple of more phone calls, man. People are telling me they they love it. I and some friend requests. I got some friend requests and some some ladies that uh, get back to me, and they they said I, they've been watching every one of my podcasts and they think i'm i'm funny and they, they and they well we're, we're both funny. they say we're both funny i don't want to take credit for everything but they, they, you, <laughs> you and griff are funny you know <laughs> said you're enjoyable to watch and i just huh. well i appreciate that and thank you for your time yeah <laughs> well we don't mean to be we just kind of probably because we're dysfunctional and we don't know what we're talking about sometimes and it's funny <laughs> <laughs> but, i think yeah. i think they liked it when you was talking about shooting cold water up your butthole last week mm -hmm. but i was talking well yeah about yeah you started bidet. you started that though with talking about the bow day over in europe and i just told you about how i had used one <laughs> over at zach's house and and uh but yeah i'd always seen those things back when i was working in uh in the flooring business and you know and i always thought you know why would i want to try that i thought it was for vaginal uh -huh. use i didn't oh, know all the, yeah yeah I did. yeah all the band guys when we over there go craig did you try that that thing that shoots hot water up your butthole i went no i didn't try that they said, they said <laughs> You got to give that a try. It's a rush. And then yeah. I was telling you about it. And you said, yeah, the only one I ever used had cold water in it. <laughs> I think you know, I actually have one of those, Craig. I got one of those in my closet. And the, you know, the reason I bought it was when they had that toilet paper shortage. <laughs> and I got that thing and I was like, well, I'm, I'm not going to use any toilet paper then if they're going to run out. I, I mean, I'll just get one of those things. <laughs> and then it, we never really ran out. So I, uh, mm -hmm. I never installed it, but <laughs> maybe we can give one of those away. I'll give that away. Give away a bidet. <laughs> the yeah. bidet giveaway <laughs> on the stone roadie show. Yeah. We, you know, we can get Gene Odom <laughs> to sign it or something. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if somebody might really take that seriously oh. <laughs> yeah I, I, I just got a couple of uh, uh yeah our disciple dave he sent he sent two hundred dollars and he wants that to go to paul welsh and he's last what, couple last week he sent <laughs> sent me a couple big old packages and asked me to form, forward them to to Paul, and then uh, today he included about some some postage markers and stuff like that to send. But I still don't think I have his address. 
but uh, yeah, he sent a couple of hundred dollars to to go to Paul Welsh, and then uh, and then uh, oh, uh, who is it? Uh, Jeff uh, Mar Marcon Marconet. Yeah, I went to the post office box. I got your uh, your pictures. You wanted me to sign? I'll sign them and get them out to you. But you already postmarked that, so that'll be easy for me to do. <laughs> yeah and then uh, of course ricky waskin bought those posters back there and that's 450 bucks and and that goes to uh to mark howard and um then he bought that shirt that my grass is blue that's 100 bucks goes to gene odom and you're going to be getting a check for that in the mail pretty soon craig so when you see that from ricky that was that was what that was for yeah i'll be sending all sending out some some money i've been trying to you know save it up a little bit so i can send out at least you know a few hundred bucks at a time yeah yeah well you know i mean there's still well, I owe uh, leslie some and i owe uh, mark frank some and i owe now i owe paul welsh some so we'll get we'll be getting that out and and while i'm at it i'll get together your all your stickers that i've <laughs> for the money i've been yeah and don't forget shelby's stick. coin and Shelby's coin, yeah, I'm I'm pretty delinquent in my duties there. I, I just got my property tax figured out today and had to rush it down. <laughs> it's my, my, uh, uh, oh, whatever you call it when I try to get my property tax reduced because <laughs> all this damage they did in my front yard, the city of Green and warmest builders put all that silt and filled my pond up with silt now now uh now thanks to tom at tom's uh land clearing and and services we're gonna get that take care of here in the next yeah months. <laughs> and gene i heard gene found out about that he's gonna come out there and see if you dig up any of those money jars <laughs> oh yeah and that, that, that did we talk about that the uh, that, that uh, Jesus for survivors thought that would be a good place to put uh, the for the Griff Martin uh, disciple baptism. Disciple. Yeah, the baptismal place. Yeah, that, that would be a good place. Yeah, we can take all those heathens down there that that are our nemesis. <laughs> the the Griff. Yeah, we already got the wishing well here. That you know, we we almost got a little tourist attraction here. You know, we got yeah. Alan are we got the wishing well now we got the Bip, griff barton baptismal pond you know so well what about is that gonna be a, a pond or like a creek creek or what is it gonna be it's gonna be a combination creek pond you know where you take a creek and dam it up and make it like a beaver does you know dams it up makes a pond a lake or pond well you know what you you know what you could do craig is you could build you a hell house there and then you could you could park Alan's car outside the door, and then, you know, then you know we could we could uh, go out there and have parties and baptismals. Oh yeah, yeah. We used to ice when we was kids. Everybody used to come over here and ice skate on it and stuff. It was pretty cool. Fish there used to be fish in there, and people used to ice skate and stuff. Yeah, but they have parties and all that stuff, but. Uh, that was a long time ago. Yeah, those kids come down there and ice skate, and if one of them gets hurt now, he'll sue you. <laughs> because, you know, they're those kids nowadays, they, you know, they, they can't hardly do anything, man. They're, they're all heavy, and, you know, they don't get out, they don't run, they don't do anything at PE. They just uh, want to get on the tablets all the time. When we was kids, we'd get out there and anything that would float, and we'd get one person on it on, out there floating, and then we'd get on and play King of the Raft or whatever, and try to yeah. get, knock, knock everybody off of it. You know? but, uh, yeah, because, you know, there there wasn't a whole lot. You had to make your own fun. And oh, yeah. Nowadays, you know, they just stay in the house and get on the Game Boy or whatever it is. You know, I can't even remember half of that stuff but uh yeah I, yeah yeah I, I posted something on facebook my back in my day you could you could make an afternoon with a closed line and, and an old sheet to make a tent 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's staying there all day, all day. <laughs> yeah, build tree houses and, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. But Yeah, wasn't well, much to do. Yeah, hey, I heard um, that uh, you had a... Uh, you got a picture of Pepper walking down the aisle with Artemis there. Oh yeah, man, that got a lot of that got a lot of traction, man. Yeah, somebody said I never seen a bri barefoot bride before. She had a be this beautiful dress on, and she was barefoot. You know? Oh really? <laughs> yeah, look barefoot, anyways. Yeah, Artemis looked good. Yeah, it was a nice picture of both of them. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's got good. Married Saturday, the twenty third, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh that's kind of like proof right there that you know everything's hunky dory between those two, you know, and uh you know it's uh it's you know not true about what was said about Artemis and so um you know hopefully she'll want to come on and talk about that and uh, be looking for that. But of course Craig's not going to bug her. She'll she'll have to get a hold of Craig and if that's what something she wants to do and get her on and hopefully we can I can go see Artemis and have a little chat with him. I'll maybe do a rig rundown on his drums or something. We'll uh, <laughs> have to cross our fingers on that one there, Craig. Yeah, I'm not going to push it, but if she <laughs> wants to do it, she will, uh, you know, I'll be more than glad to have her come on. I, it'd be cool to have her come on, I think. It'd be really oh, cool. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then, you know, really? a lot of comments. Talking Chris about and Marshall and the whole gang, you know. Yeah, and, getting all the kids, the Skinner kids on there. That would be uh Yeah, get Lee Lee on here and get yeah, get some of the kids on here. I think have a reunion. Enjoy that. Yeah. Have a little reunion. Get Chad on there and let Chad head it up. <laughs> Maybe we'll take a vacation day that day and let, <laughs> let Chad head that up and run the whole thing. <laughs> <clears throat> that sounds like a good plan right there. <laughs> then you say you had a nice chat with Steve Lawler on the phone. Oh man, yeah, Steve. You know, we 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 kind of said that Steve was going to be our first guest, and uh, he called me. He goes, "Man, I'm sorry." He said, "I've had some little bit of health issues here." And he said, "But he said, yeah, I, I don't check because I messaged him on Facebook. I said, man, I need to bug you, but you know, you said you I said at one time you showed a little interest, and maybe you'd you know come on the show, and then." And uh, but I don't want Buggy. And he called me and goes, "Yeah, man, I'm sorry. I don't check I check Facebook too much anymore." He says, "Yeah, I still work for Live Nations. What What do you guys want to talk about?" And I goes, "Yeah, just call Griff, and we'll just kind of put up some kind of a format about what we want to talk about." He goes, "I goes, well, if you want, I'll get on Facebook and ask you know, say you're coming on and ask people if want to know if, about ask you a question." He goes. I don't think anybody knows who I am. I said, "Oh, don't I? You know that? Don't let the 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 that fool you." He said, I, they, "A lot of people know a lot more than you think about you and this whole situation." You know, but he he had a lot of stuff to talk about. He was awake during the whole thing, and so he was there with uh, Mark Frank and and Kenny Peden and and uh, Artemis when they all you know, took off on their quest to go get help, you know, and he was talking, I don't want to tell too much about it, but yeah, it was an inter he had some interesting conversation about that whole situation. The only thing he, we talked about was how different everybody's stories were, you know, and, uh, and uh, yeah, that, that, but that's just the way it is under a situation. One, one thing we did say, he said, I said, well, you know, under a, a tragic situation like that, where your life is flashing in front of your eyes, you know, you're 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 liable to think of all kind of stuff. He goes, Craig, I never thought that. He says, I, you know, I never panicked or nothing. I just kind of rode it down. I go, you know, Steve, I did the same thing. You know, I I remember looking out the window and God thought we was gonna sl belly slide into that pipeline, but looking at See, he was sitting by the window, and I was sitting by the aisle, so I had to get up. And, but he could see everything that was out there. But that other guy said, I, I guess out the other window, I guess we were paralleling a highway, and I guess maybe that was 55 from what um, – Highway 55 from what uh, Steve Lawler was saying. It must have been Highway 55, and, yeah, that's a big road. Was he sitting beside you? No, he was sitting on the – window side on the uh, across from me oh okay yeah 
He said, when we woke up, I guess we were all piled on you guys. He said, me and Mark Howard woke up, woke, were kind of close to each other, you know, but uh, I don't know where I was, you know. When, when yeah, I got, to, I got to meet him at the monument when they did that, uh, that uh, unveiling of that new Ronnie statue and uh, when he was out there, remember, and uh, nice guy, really nice guy. Yeah, I mean, he, he kind of emphasized that he'd been there before, but when he found <laughs> out that I was going, that he kind of made a, wanted to go again, yeah. So, yeah, he's busy. He still works with Live Nation and still does concerts and stuff, you know, so. Yeah, really cool guy. And um, Yeah, man, he's been in the business for a long time. He was a, a <clears> big... <throat> Big, uh, he was Peter Frampton's uh, production manager, you know. So, oh, wow. Yeah, so, yeah, I'll, I'll let him talk about all that one. Yeah, we can ask him. All but he's supposed of... to be giving you a call here relatively soon, so. Yeah, I heard my friend phone ring a few minutes ago. Maybe that was him. Uh, I don't know why he'd be up that early, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, really? <laughs> Probably just a solicitor. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of that, um, we got a, a 50 minute interview with that Mike O'Hara continuing the Mike O'Hara interview. And, um, after this jibber jabber, Dennis Wilson, 50 minutes of a detailed description of a first responder, um, who, uh, went into detail about a lot of stuff on the, uh, on the plane that he saw witnessed and, and he helped remove everyone out of the plane. So, if you're a little squeamish about the whole idea about the Leonard Skinner plane crash, I don't suggest that you listen to that. But for people that are interested in hearing, you know, exactly the details, uh, it's not really like a gory thing or anything. It's just description of the details. I suggest you listen to that, Craig. He um, he uh, talks a lot about stuff that you might want to that you never probably heard about before. So, drawing so uh you know if you want to want to get involved in that drawing and cut off points april 1st theoretically april 2nd will be, if it's supposed if you send me something on that's marked in my email april 2nd it's not supposed to be no good but that, that's negotiable you know at this point <laughs> we yeah, want to huh? keep it you know we'll keep this going as long as we can get as many people to participate as possible that's why we kind of left this one run a little bit extended this time but uh yeah and then give them give us a couple weeks to put it together and uh figure out how what we're going to draw and what your number is going to be and see if we can notify everybody with your number and this that and the other thing and then we'll have ourselves a drawing yeah we're going to try to get our stonette shelby barrett in on some of the uh drawing uh maybe you know go over the names and the numbers of who goes with the names and and then craig can draw out of the hat um but uh yeah i got shelby hooked up with a laptop now and she uh also picked up a couple donations for us today um i forget what they were but somebody donated some stuff uh kent griffith donated and gave it to her so uh some more donations uh they were actual um skin mobilia that we're going to be auctioning off so we got more skin mobilia and uh you guys have donations that you want to send in right there craig reed p.o box 442 green ohio 44232 and uh you know he's uh pretty good about keeping all that organized and he'll mention your name on the podcast and thank you for it and then if you want to send in anything that's conceivably skinnered memorabilia then uh send it there too 
And then, of course, you got the email over there where you can send it for entering the contest. And uh, then another thing cool I, I got going on, uh, Craig, is I've been talking to Anna uh, Ethington. Her to- her uh, husband, Tom, and her are going to take a crack at the uh, supportsurvivors.net because um, it's just kind of sitting there because – I don't really have enough time to mess with that website. So they're going to um, go in there and they're going to fix it up and make it usable where we can put um, the uh, donations on there and, and you can purchase them right off the website. And if you want to, um, if you want to uh, buy some, like we'll have like a, uh, a, uh, a store that you can buy stuff out of stickers and things like that. So we're working on that. And thank you very much, Anna, for, I hope she'll end up going ahead and saying she'll do it. She sounded like she was, uh, she was interested in it, but but once she starts working on it, she might change her mind. Cause I know it's a lot of work doing that, taking care of a website, but thanks Anna and Tom appreciate that. Yeah, we got a bunch of comments. You want to go over them, Craig, off of the uh, last podcast, and uh, really, uh, yeah, I, I went over a few of them. Why? When I quit looking, we had like forty-five. God, you were saying we had like ninety or something. About uh, eighty, something like eighty-seven comments. <laughs> and, uh, a lot of that's probably replies and things like that. But yeah, we appreciate all the comments and people watching and like and subscribe because that's how the uh, the plane crash survivors get paid. You know, is through through our uh, monetization. And uh, it's uh, and I think we bumped up quite a few more subscriptions. I noticed it's starting to build up a little bit. So so if we can get Craig to pull his pants down or something crazy <laughs> and then go viral and we'll uh you know maybe we'll pick up some more i just keep saying i just got to get better at this but you know i'm uh you know effort yeah, now we'll get that it, we'll, it is we'll get that bow day <laughs> and i'll send that bow day to you and you can demonstrate it <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, so so yeah anyway right to the comments um I guess yeah, oh Larry. He's Larry. He calls himself Larry Tate, but that's our, that's our uh, disciple, Larry Tate. Uh, yeah, I, I yeah. I think he's, yeah, stickers. His name's Dave. Yeah, yeah, Dave the disciple. He's got another name, Larry Tate, and uh, <laughs> he was talking about that because I made the comment about Charles Manson. You know, you know, there, <laughs> the lot of validity what Charles Manson says. Uh, even though he, you know, he's a murderer, but I mean, I don't think they caught him actually murdering anybody, but they sure pinned it on him. But, uh, yeah, he said, uh, one thing that Charlie did say that was true was, uh, you know, that the judges and the, and the lawyers are all sneaky bastards, which kind of reminds me, Craig, you ever seen that video or where that lawyer it's on a, it's on a YouTube video and the lawyer some guy they just got out of court and uh i guess maybe it was a divorce court or something and the <laughs> guy was pissed off and he was and he had a pistol and he was and it had a lawyer pinned around a tree and he was shooting <laughs> around the tree at the lawyer <laughs> and it was going on for like five minutes you guys <laughs> check it out on youtube and, uh, that's, that guy probably deserved every bit of that. And for what I understand, he, he got hit a few times. So I think it was like a 22 pistol, but yeah, go on YouTube and Google, um, uh, court, court loser shoots lawyer around tree. Uh, again, <laughs> it'll come up. It's hilarious. Uh, it's kind of not funny really, if you think about it, but. Uh, <laughs> to the lawyers because i know those damn lawyers are some of them are real crooks then we got let me see here um this uh one gal robin says great thing for technology at the time alan uh was in the crash or he might have lost his arm uh i know he is his arm was in bad shape right? yeah Craig? his arm was horrible yeah mm-hmm. gene actually says that uh now, he went in to visit Alan and he noticed that Alan's arm didn't look too good. 
and he called somebody in there and they said, Hey, this was like Gan Green setting in and uh Allen's arm and they they were like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's kinda like Gene had to figure that out for him, but they uh that's when they started giving it a lot of attention and uh I think they hit him with a bunch of antibiotics and then seems like uh his dad uh wouldn't let him cut his arm off. You know, they were like wanting to cut it off. And his dad said, no, you're going to have to try. And they got a specialist or something in there. And, and uh, they were able to save his arm. So uh, then uh, moving right along, somebody said, asked Craig, did you see Alan Collins band at the summer on the beach, Fort Lauderdale, 1983? Well, I would have been there. Me and Mike Sparks were there, you know, but uh, uh summer on the beach in Fort Lauderdale, 1983. We did like six shows. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I ran the sound there. It was an indoor thing. Okay. And it was an indoor thing and yeah. Yeah. I think that's the place where I got I got really drunk and I was out front and <laughs> running the sound and 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 uh, after uh, uh, when they went off for Freebird, I I kind of nodded off for a minute and Gene come out and shook me and woke me up. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, that was a club. I it. I got drunk, man. <laughs> I remember oh, yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There you go, Craig. You know, he every now yeah, and then. Yeah, it was it was real loud. That's where the guy the guy I, I I just I went out front because I, I I'm not a sound guy, but I know what it's supposed to sound like and you know, and I, I kept telling the guy to try I wanted to I wanted to feel the kick drum, you know. <laughs> and you know, when you get that kick drum up and the bass drum up, you gotta pull everything up with it you know and uh so it got loud <laughs> oh, <laughs> we, and, just, and, we just come out of the studio you know and i'm used to hearing that stuff you know right <laughs> you yeah know, that's, you know and i was like i said i was a little bit intoxicated so i wanted to feel it you know? <laughs> yeah when you're live you can't you can't quite ain't like being in the studio <laughs> It's kind of a two-part question. He says, or have you heard the 85 tape of Alan and Artemis rehearsing, which I think Kent Griffith gave me a copy of that. Um, I actually played a little bit of it already. It was Alan playing guitar and Artemis and, and Alan were practicing and they recorded it. If that's the same one, I'll, uh, dig that out and we'll make sure we put that on the podcast so people can hear it it's pretty good it's pretty interesting it's it's actually guitar work that alan did that not a lot of people have heard before so it was artemis that's when artemis uh kent said artemis telling the story about how artemis threw the uh the uh drumstick and it stuck <laughs> in the wall or they was wondering where it went did anybody get hurt because uh Artie, he was a little scared about that, you know, uh, hurting people with a drumstick. But <laughs> then when he got in Canada and he was throwing drums, he wasn't worried about hitting people with drums. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's what happened, right? That's what happened to Artie up in Canada. He was, he went kind of like on a tirade and threw a bunch of. He drums. was kicking his drums all off the stage and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think he threw a tambourine in it. Hit Gary and Gary threw it back or something. I don't remember exactly what <laughs> happened. Yeah, but uh, yeah. yeah. And but I was just sitting here thinking to myself, you know, people think, "What the hell was he doing? Getting drunk? He's down there working." And if you don't understand well how somebody in in their earlier thirties could get could get drunk at at, at in, Fort, in Fort Lauderdale on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah well I, well, well i'm sorry <laughs> i tell you man over there on the east coast back in the 70s and the 80s there were some really good concerts i saw the eagles i, I remember i saw the eagles there and they were just like hardly even that really well known yet but they were like walking around you could talk to them and you know i mean now you know they got guards and everything but back then they were <laughs> 
They were cool. Oh, those were some crazy times. Those those bars down there in the in, in the uh, the beach, Daytona. Oh yeah, they all playing those bars in the summertime. That was crazy, man. Yeah, because they had that spring break, you know, and it was oh, just a ton God. of people. Wet, uh, and every place we went had a wet T-shirt contest. Oh, Everyone, yeah. man, you know. That was. I was that, telling. That was like the opening act, the wet T-shirt contest. Yeah. <laughs> I was telling Chad one time uh, I was at the bar and I was the guy who poured the water on the on the gal's T-shirts. <laughs> That was like the best job I ever had, you know. <laughs> I was kind of like the MC, you know, and I got up there. And then they, the next time they did it, they say you couldn't pour water. You had to use a spray bottle. Oh, God. I guess it was it was too revealing. Well, it's, it's talking about women with, with large breasts. <laughs> I was watching the thing about James Mansfield today on TV, and, <laughs> and, and they were – they were talking about you know her and Marilyn Monroe and uh, what was her name? Why don't you come up and see me, Mae West? Yeah, yeah, and oh, yeah. And, and how how and how Jane Mansfield and Marilyn Monroe were were both with the Kennedys. You know, John and and Bobby Kennedy. They both both had their turn with the Kennedy brothers. You know. Oh yeah. Probably if they <laughs> if they didn't, they wouldn't get a movie contract. You know. <laughs> probably say hey you want to go to you want to be in hollywood you, you know you're gonna have to you know pay your dues over here with yeah. us kennedys things aren't too much different than they were now <laughs> no. they were then i guess well you know? now we just know about it except they were better them. looking back then though <laughs> it seems yeah like better than monica Lewinsky and uh, <laughs> and uh I was I was telling this guy I worked with, and he believed me. I said, you know, I was down there at that uh, down there in Washington D.C. where they have the uh, the Declaration of Independence, you know. And I said, well, I couldn't believe it. Right next to that thing, they had Monica Lewinsky's dress with a black light on it, and it had <laughs> the uh, the uh, Clinton royal jelly on there. Well, you know, Bill Bill Clinton, he he got hooked up with Sweet Connie, you know. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Sweet really? Connie. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the, that's breaking. Put up your breaking news, Craig. That's, that's breaking news on the Stone Roadie Show. Monica Lewinsky and Bill and. Uh, no, no, sweet no, Connie. No, no, sweet, sweet Connie and sweet both Connie, of them. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. That's breaking news. <laughs> So she's in the Monica club. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Bill, he had to try sweet Connie. He heard about her. <laughs> well, little rock, you know? Yeah. Oh, he's a, he's a real pig. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, people even, you know, they'll like even approach him in public and start just saying mean things to him. He just kind of snickers at him and walks off. Yeah. <laughs> then we got this gal on our uh, comments, Kimmy. Hey, Kimmy, you know, thank you for all the comments. Uh, I think we might have got her a little upset because kind of like acting like she couldn't retire, you know, because we were kind of making fun of people in the last we were talking about. <laughs> Y'all go to work. Y'all go to work and, and pay your taxes so Craig and I can get our Social Security checks and, you know, <laughs> y'all get to I work. Was, I wasn't making fun of anybody. <laughs> I was just bragging because I'm retired. But, uh, you know, it seems ever since I just started doing these podcasts, I ain't retired no more, oh, man. It's, it's that's a job. Man, at Christmas. Yeah, get up at three o'clock in the morning. What the hell's going <laughs> on? You know? I'm kind of used to it. You know, I had uh, a lot of crazy hours working at the space center. Every time they roll out a space shuttle, that was like a 16 hour move, you know, and, <laughs> and I would work all kinds of different shifts and did that for over 30 years. So, so my dysfunction is, uh, turned into normalcy now. Um, you know, I can, sleep a couple hours and get up and go watch a boxing match and go back to bed and sleep. You kind of do that, Craig. Like I you know. I got a lot of hours on my flight simulator. I'm I'm learning the the coast. <laughs> yeah. Take my F F15 up the coast. 
you know, I, I can I can do a thousand miles an hour in that thing, man. I can cover a lot of territory. <laughs> well, I tell you what, some of those things, man, they're scary when you like. I saw a, a video of a uh, of, of a fighter jet breaking the sound barrier right beside a. It looked like a. Um, yeah, yeah, I posted shit. that. Yeah, it went, it went right you? across. It went right across the uh, about man. 50 feet off the off the water across from a, a ship could you yeah. imagine yeah yeah you could see the um waves coming off of it whatever they were i knew this uh asian girl one time i took her to uh one of those um where you where you go and you see uh it's like a uh air show you know those air shows and she was from Cambodia and she uh actually went through the Khmer Rouge and we were walking along and and a jet one of those jets flew over and she jumped in the ditch <laughs> she, she goes yeah she goes and then she goes what was that and I showed her and it flew back over and she goes you know I never knew what that was every time they flew over in Cambodia we never could see it we only heard it and she goes now I know what that was <laughs> God, you know, she jumped in the freaking ditch. I had to pull her out of there. <laughs> that was kind of funny. So yeah, Kimmy, uh, yeah, thanks. Well, we're sorry if you know you ain't been able to retire and she sounded like a real nice girl. Well, yeah, a lot of people are like that, man. They never do retire. That's yeah, the, you know, well, well, they can't. I mean, you well, know. yeah, it's the it's the Biden economy, you know. <laughs> yeah, you can't. I mean, well, some people are getting like a thousand dollars a month Social Security. Some people are getting six hundred, you know. And I, I mean, I went to the grocery store the other day, and I had in one hand a hundred dollars worth of groceries. So yeah, times are getting tough, man. And uh, I guess I, I think I need just to start growing stuff out in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, with weird stuff going on, too, like that bridge, you know, that Francis Scott Key Bridge that got knocked down by that barge. The people are kind of wondering, you know, is that like a, a cover-up for the Puff Diddy thing, you know? You see what happened with Puff Diddy, Craig? I didn't see what uh, – uh, uh... No, uh, I didn't. I I saw I saw something his picture on something, but I don't. Oh know. yeah, they raided his house, and uh, they you know they're they're saying he's child uh, trafficking and stuff like that. So no alleged, kidding. allegedly, you know, we need to put that out there because you know we don't want to get in trouble. It's oh like yeah, that. like what's that medication those fat people take, Craig? Ozempa. <laughs> Uh, Oz Ozempa, yeah, <laughs> Ozempa. <laughs> Get you yeah, they even wrote a song about it. You know, they huh? even used. They brought back an old song and oh, Ozempa. You know, and it's like oh boy, everybody's happy and they're injecting stuff to get to lose weight, and everybody's having an injection party of Ozempa, which is not really <laughs> not really Ozempa, but that's what we'll call it. Yeah. <laughs> I know everybody knows what I'm talking about, especially retired people. Cause if you turn on the TV during the day and you're retired, that's all you see is, is drug commercials. There's probably a lot of people out there that are on that shit. You know, 80% of you are obese. I mean, that's from what I, from what I hear and from what I see. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it ain't, there's one guy, Craig, he was talking, he was from Europe. And he says he comes over to the United States quite often, I think on business. And he says he eats the same stuff when he comes to the United States at the same amount of foods, but he puts on a pound every week <laughs> and it's the same food. So, you know, it's the ingredients that's that they're putting in there, you know, all this corn syrup, the fructose corn syrup and, you know, and the, and the Cokes over there have actual real sugar in it. And over here, they've got that that corn syrup, so it's cheaper. High fructose, yeah. Well, somebody yeah. went to a, a, a club the other night to see a band, and they said they said they said they, it's funny. People say, and, and I thought about you because there were so many fat people. I hear that. I hear that all the time. They said I never really <laughs> noticed it until until oh yeah until you and now. 
And now everywhere I go, I, I, go, I just laugh because I look, see them, and I think about you, and I start laughing. Because I, you're, I, he says, cause you're right. You know, it's, it's pathetic. I've what actually, people, man? God. Yeah, I've actually yeah. got up and like, you know, like late at night and I go to the refrigerator and I'll go, nah, Craig wouldn't like that. You know, Craig, Craig, Craig was watching me right now. He called me a fat ass. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, okay. Moving right <clears throat> along and we'll move out of the fat topic. Maybe we'll go back in there. I don't know who knows, but uh, a guy named Brian. <clears throat> mentioned that um oh yeah maybe there wasn't skinner didn't win, win a musical grammy but they won a uh save the fox theater award i guess leon accepted that yeah Remember i that? posted that it was funny they said he got up there and he goes and i and i want to sing a song about it is there a piano player here and they go yeah. no no piano player. No, I said, okay, bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On top stage. And they kind of, and they kind of like took him like, huh? Cause he said, okay, I want to sing a song about, we got a piano player, no piano player. Oh, okay. Bye. <laughs> well, what was the and walked song? off stage. Yeah. Do you know what the song was? I have no idea. He says, you know, it was a song about saving the Fox. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I guess he had, written a song about saving the fox but uh yeah i saw mary beth medley she was the woman that was sitting beside him that was like our kind of a manager type person oh, yeah. she, she was the cool. one that was dating cameron crow yeah that cameron crow man he gets around with the rock bands he yeah is. yeah he hung around with us you know quite a bit you know yeah and, and did yeah, you well, say because of mary beth yeah yeah, somebody was saying, hey, get Cameron Crow on the Stone Roadie show. I was like, oh, yeah, give me his phone number. I'll ring him up and see what he says about that. <laughs> but I've been noticing, you know, uh, a lot of people, um, like, are doing a lot of uh, podcasts and things, I guess. And it, like, for example, Peter Frampton's been doing a ton of them since he's retired and he's got that nerve disease and uh he's been doing a ton of stuff there's um, a yeah there's everybody yeah ozzy and um danica patrick and dale earnhardt jr and god yeah. everybody god everybody Every, does podcasts. yeah, they, yeah i mean we you know we kind of jumped in there on the podcast bandwagon too but We've been doing it for two years, so I didn't know. jump in there. People wanted me to write a book. I said, I ain't writing no dang book. And then this guy from Music Explorer magazine, sorry, I'm trying to hold one. <laughs> <laughs> they called me and, <coughs> and, and talked me into doing a podcast. And I go, okay, what do I need? And so he said, go get a microphone and a camera. And I said, okay. So I did that. And then he got COVID. And and then that fell through, and then I, you know, said, "Hey, I got this stuff, <coughs> and now I ain't got no use for it." And you said, "Well, I got a mic and a camera, and you know, let me interview you." People are asking me about, you know, stuff because I know you, and they want to know questions. I said, oh, "We'll just do a little podcast." I said, "Yeah, okay, we'll do that." So then that, that was just for Facebook, fake book. Yeah. You know, and then we, then we, you know, we, you have to go through YouTube to do them. So we decided to do that. And here we are, you know, 148 podcast, two years, two years at this, we've been doing this. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, which, which leads me into the next comment. Guy says he would rather hear skin formation on the stone roadie show than get attacked on Facebook. <laughs> yeah you say the wrong thing on facebook about leonard skinner man they climb your ass <laughs> on those fan sites you know it's like you, know, you want to get into some knockdown drag out stuff on those <laughs> fan sites. and you know what's funny is is uh i see people and they're saying screwed up things all the time that just aren't true and and i see joe crimple you know he's like he's on all those fan sites and he don't ever say a word and then I'll talk to him later and he'll go, Griff, did you hear what that lady said? You know, 
<laughs> yeah, he gets pure entertainment out of being on that uh, on those fan sites. And I saw guy. a good picture of him uh, the other day uh, with with Billy Powell and uh, and uh, oh were, yeah, yeah, they were wanting to know who Carol Carroll was. They said, "Who's that woman in front of Billy Powell?" It was Carol Carroll. And uh, Joe Crimp was in there. <clears throat> I think that was Joe. Yeah, um, and uh, he's, you know, got so much in his mind like you, Craig. I mean, it's just like, but this guy, he's like, I've a, a, got a photographic memory for a lot of stuff. Although, um, Timmy, you know, Gary Stable Boy was uh, was telling me that, of course, you know, Joe was in the in the car when Gary hit hit the tree, you know, Oak tree, you're in my way. Joe was in the, in the car and Joe told me, yeah, we went to Gary's house after that, you know, we partied and then, and then Tim says, you know, I had to talk to Joe and say, Hey man, you know, Gary ended up in the hospital after that, uh, which I don't know if you remember that Craig, but, uh, I guess Gary got pretty hurt hitting that Oak tree and, uh, did it cause like, some issues as far as uh, uh a yeah, that, yeah we had to cancel some shows yeah you know? yeah ronnie wasn't happy about that yeah yeah well those yeah, guys were kind of crazy about, man but uh and then later on you said they after you know they they start they returned after the the plane crash you said they were like canceling shows left and right just irresponsible as hell well, you know, that's when Artemis talks about him and Ronnie talking about, you know, them starting something else. You know, Ronnie Ronnie was concerned that, you know, one of them guys was going to kill themselves, you know, and he had, you know, his concerns were warranted, you know. I mean, no, God, yeah, either Alan so. or Gary, you know, if you lose, you know, either one of those guys, you're, you know, you, you know, pretty much lost the feel of Leonard Skinner, you know? Yeah, yeah especially when Alan, Alan got that damn motorcycle. And uh, they were like, oh, my God. Because, you know, they, Joe and Gary both got a motorcycle. And Alan said, oh, I got to get a faster one than that. Yeah, he got one of them Kawasaki 500 3 oh, so yeah. Those things are dangerous. Oh, my God. Because I had two yeah. of those. I had one that it ran and I had another one with a parts bike and I, I finally sold it. That thing was like quintessential of a crotch rocket back then. Um, things were crazy fast, quick, really quick. Um, yeah. So, uh, that, uh, yeah, that guy, uh, uh was talking about the Facebook and, yeah, you know, you, you don't get attacked on uh, the Stone Roadie show because, you know, you can't really talk to us or anything. So it's not like, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're having, I mean, we'll go over the comments and things, but I don't think anybody's going to attack you in the comment section. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And then let um, me see here, a uh, guy named Joe, I think it's Joe Mueller, uh, big fan of the Stone Roadie show. What did Ronnie think about Eric Clapton's version of cocaine would you happen to know what ronnie thought about that craig no i don't know i really don't know what his opinion of of that was sorry <laughs> yeah uh i guess he did like jj kale though because you know oh yeah yeah, yeah they call me the breeze and i happen to see eric clapton and jj kale at the lakeland civic center and happen to be if I ever run into Eric Clapton, I'll say, Hey man, I want my money back for that. That <laughs> totally sucked. I mean, he, he was so messed up, I guess on drugs what? and he didn't even play. You know, what year you was know. that? What year was that? 19, I'm thinking 80, that was probably 83, 82. 80. Yeah. I'm thinking it was something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's when he was, you know, messed up with the heroin, but he didn't even play any of the lead songs. He, you know, we got out there and sang a little bit and it was, it sucked. It really it yeah. was like one of the worst concerts I've ever seen in my life. Um, not saying that that's, you know, how it is now, but it certainly was then. It was, I actually, you know, was with my buddy Jay and I think he left. 
I think he hated it so bad he left. So uh, <laughs> yeah. he's got some health issues now. I think with his yeah, he's got some nerve issues and yeah, uh, his hands or something. Yeah, yeah, but I yeah, I'd heard, say I don't know. Hey, anything. Eric, you remember that time you came to the Lakeland Civic Center? <laughs> Man, I want my money back. I want my uh, fourteen dollars back. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll get through this and then we'll go ahead and uh wrap it up uh person asked can we hear more about the uh time jojo called craig a man whore <laughs> how many times my god she always said that <laughs> what was the reason craig i mean were you just like you know i mean i know I you said I guess because I was a man whore. I don't know. Well, didn't you tell you know, me that, that uh, all these ladies wanted to go meet Ronnie and you would go, how bad do you want to meet Ronnie? There's <laughs> probably, there's, you know, there's, you know, pick a number. I got, there's a lot of reasons why you could call me that, I guess. And, and then, then Craig goes, ask, how bad, Kathy how Godsey, bad do you, as oh. Kathy Godsey, she met me on the road. She scared, I scared the hell out of her. <laughs> these girls come to Craig and they go, and they go, oh, we want to go meet Ronnie. How bad do you want to meet Ronnie? And then, you know, <laughs> then he goes and he has his way with him and then he don't tell Ronnie, you know, and now Ronnie's like, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Kathy Godsey tells me when she met, she, she said that had to be been you, you know, <laughs> before, you know, you know, back in the, you know, the Ross and Collins days, she, that had to have been you. <laughs> well, it was like a kid at a candy store though. I mean, <laughs> you know, back then all the girls were slim. Hey, hey baby. They, yeah. They looked good. <laughs> and you, and you had, you know, free pick of anyone you wanted. Why, you, know? you want to come on the bus? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're lucky, you know, that you, <clears throat> you lived through that. I mean, that was had to be horrible, Craig. <laughs> yeah, so there was that, and I uh, want to hear, they want to hear more about the honkettes. Um, yeah, so we'll have to... <clears throat> We'll have to talk some more, dig up some more info on the Honkettes. I'll see if Kent Griffith has anything about the Honkettes or something that he might have snagged somewhere. Or if anybody knows anything about the Honkettes, let us know. Put in the comments. Uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, let me see here. Um, guy says uh, he was laughing when we were talking about the the bow day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I read a couple of different comments that people thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah, that was that sure sure was exhilarating that time I tried it. <laughs> okay, let me see what else we got here. Um would love would love to have Craig play his movies and narrate the movies. Uh, yeah, I so saw can, that one. Yeah, yeah so that, that yeah, we'll have idea. to do that sometime. I'll I'll put up the ones that are watermarked and and sit here and talk about them. What we yeah, were, couldn't you put them on? Your yeah, it'll make me and give me some practice. But I'll I'll put up yeah. up parts of the movie and we'll I'll narrate them and. Uh, couldn't know, couldn't you put them on your green screen and just kind of move out of the way and then sit there and narrate it? <laughs> I'll have to figure out how to, how yeah. to uh, put it put it up on a on a something. Yeah, I I could put I, yeah I could put them up behind me, but I'd be sitting here. Yeah, you could just. I, I have out to of figure way. out how to put myself up in the corner or something. I don't know. Yeah, we'll we'll work <laughs> on that. We'll work on yeah. that. Yeah, maybe We're, I could do that. I've yeah, I never never had explored that avenue. I've never need had a need to do it people do it i guess you can do it i don't know i might have to use a different uh i don't know if you can do it on zoom oh yeah you're there's a way to do it we just haven't taken an interest into doing it yet i mean it's like we're kind of like technophobes when it comes to that <laughs> shit you know <laughs> you're yeah lucky I, I do what i i'm doing <laughs> exactly exactly that's why you know i got anna to take over that website because I told her, I said, it's just sitting there and I don't have time for it, you know, and I'm paying for it, but 
you know, we really need to utilize it. And so I'm thinking that's going to work out pretty good. Uh, uh, yeah. And then somebody we're talking about, you know, uh, Ronnie on the Dolly Parton thing. And I was wondering, uh, cause I'd heard Ronnie was singing and that's actually on Donnie's or, uh, Dolly's, um, record, not Artemis's. So I guess Ronnie did sing, um, and you haven't heard that either, right? Greg, the free bird. I didn't, I didn't, I, I heard, uh, <clears throat> Dolly do free bird. And yeah, I so apparently Ronnie, the, the yeah, other Ronnie, songs, I haven't apparently heard, there's a, a Ronnie I heard her version. do free bird and that was it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh, here's a good question. I thought this was a great question. And I've asked Craig this before, uh, and I can't remember what he said, but um <clears throat> did uh did Ronnie ever like get pissed off at you and try to hit you or no, ever? never did. No, me no? and Ronnie never ever ever had a confrontation at all. Never no. even an argument, huh? Never, uh uh. Never, uh -huh. never, never even once, uh uh. Well, how cool is that, you know? Yeah, he never got no, no, we never never no, never had any kind of issue. But you were kind of like his uh take care of business guy. I mean Well, you know, yeah, I mean he I was his fighting buddy. <laughs> yeah. Like he would come knock on your yeah, I was on your his, door I was in the middle of the night, buddy. you know. Like he would start shit was, down in the bar. He'd come to your room <laughs> and go beat on the door and go, Craig, do I have a friend? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was, on, I was, I was his compadre. Yeah, <laughs> and that's how you got that. Uh, yeah. That whole... I can always call Craig; he'll be there for me. Yeah, that's how you got that song written about you. I guess. Yeah, yeah. he knew he could always count on me. <laughs> Did, didn't he <laughs> shove like five hundred bucks in your pocket and say, "Go take care of the light yeah. work"? Two hundred, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Two hundred dollar bills. I go take care of my light work. I'm tied up here. <laughs> And then he said, I'll write a song about that. <laughs> Just one verse. <laughs> Did, so, so is it true? Did you have a go with one of the guests and then you went upstairs and had a drink of champagne? Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, it was really nothing, nothing serious. I don't really remember. I might, I don't know. I, uh, I might have popped the guy like this or something. <laughs> I don't know, but it, I don't really remember what happened, to tell you the truth. It, it didn't last long, I know. That's all yeah. I remember. I don't know how. Well, it was enough for, for Ronnie to write about it. And I hear that song all the time, man. That's funny as I'll be. I'll be talking to Craig on the phone and then I'll hang up with him and I'll turn the radio up and it's what's your name, little girl. And I'll be like, God dang, that's weird. You know, here I'm talking to the guy that that song was written about. And then, you know, I just got off the phone with him and that's, that's happened more than <coughs> just one time. Um, uh, let me see here. I was just moving right along. Um, uh, Oh, uh, remember we were trying to figure out who Steve Vest was. You know what? I was gonna, I was gonna bring that up and forgot about it. I, I don't think I ever met the guy. I might have, and just don't remember. You know, there's a lot of stuff I don't remember, but I don't remember ever seeing that guy. And I, and 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 I commented somewhere, and Joe Crimp said, "Yeah, he was around before you came around." Yeah, so, that's what this person said, that he was actually you know, that, a legit guy. He died like six years ago, and he was around uh, with those guys before you Oh, were. he's dead now? Yeah, that's what – but he's still got videos out there. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to say anything <clears throat> bad about him because I did I, – I don't want to say, oh, he's a fraud. I, I don't remember the guy. Yeah. And so from 73 to 77, he wasn't around very much. I guess he was around before I got involved with him, which was at the end of 73, right at, at 74. So, you know, he might have, you know. Yeah, well, he's uh, got some videos out there. So I'm sure if we put in a, a search in the search engine for him, it'll pop up. I'll do that here as soon as I get I I chance. saw I saw some songs that he I think he claimed to have had credit writing that I kind of 
<laughs> don't think that you know he could have done that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like an Allman Brothers song. Oh, something. really? Huh. Yeah, some yeah. There was some song. I, I know I've he heard the name. with and I, I can't relate to that too much. I'm sure know? Joe. I don't Joe know. Crimp knows him. You know, <laughs> could be. And, uh, I just don't. Next I don't time know. I talk to Joe, he'll tell me, Griff. You know, remember I told you all about that guy? You know, and I'll be like, <laughs> Well, how many times did you tell me, Joe? I told you. I know twice, and I'll say, Well, you got to tell me three times <laughs> where I can remember it. <laughs> Yeah, and then somebody was talking about, you know, how we talk about political stuff on the podcast, and he's saying pretty much, you know, speak your mind, and it's, you know, shit that's got to be said because people got to wake up, you know, and, uh, you know, Craig, don't we don't we don't make a political channel out of this, but we do like to mention some. I just voice shit. my opinion, you know. I, you know, it's <clears throat> yeah, um, it's. It's it's too crazy to ignore. You know, uh, it's, so. Yeah, it's nuts. Almost every every day is something. I heard they reduced his uh, the amount that he's got to pay now from like four hundred and eighty million to a hundred and eighty million or something. By well, the time one, it's all over, that that he won't pay anything. One it's, thing about Mister T is he he knows how to stall better than anybody you ever seen. He's got lawyers, and that's what they all they do is drag it out until it goes away. <laughs> that that woman's whole campaign was on. She promised she was going if she got in there, she would ruin Trump. And uh, now now they're finding out that all everybody's leaving New York because they're going. God, they could do the same thing to me. And it's just, it's unprecedented. And, and you anything. meet so many people and they say, I hate Trump. I don't like Biden, but I hate Trump and I'm never going to vote for him. And I was telling Craig, I was like, you know, that's like being <laughs> on the Titanic and a rescue ship pulls up and you go, I hate the color of that ship. I'm not getting on there. I'll take my chances here. You know, yeah, if just, Biden wins ridiculous. this one, we're all screwed. I mean, oh, good God. You know, and they're going to cheat. They got, well, I don't know. I don't even well, see yeah, how they're making run. He's just. I even heard another thing about their, you know, they're, they're getting, they're prepping for the flying saucer attack. So, I mean, you laugh about that, but I've been seeing a lot of stuff about flying saucers lately, you know, and it's like, why are they bringing this stuff up if they aren't buttering us up, you know, trying to get us to believe it before They're it happens. trying to create enough chaos so there won't be an election that's why some people are trying to blame this bridge that collapsed today on that that ship they said it's, you know it seems awful funny but that that ship did crash once before it crashed over yeah it. that's it, why they they probably uh, use it they have it designed to smash bridges well it didn't hurt anything it didn't hurt anything except for itself it hit something over in uh, belgium ran into a big concrete wall and it didn't hurt the wall but it hurt the ship hmm. they got so. somebody driving that thing that know what they're doing or they either that or they do know what they're doing uh, but, let me see yeah. here it oh yeah and we were, down. <laughs> speaking of that you know we were talking about that uh that uh eclipse you know and we were mentioning how those people that uh committed suicide during that um that comet and this person i remember i asked i said hey if anybody knows who those people were comment on the comments and so uh that was the marshall apple white's heavens uh, that's who that was yeah yeah and uh, it was a cult and they and they went out and they all got brand new nike tennis shoes and they uh -huh. took our bitch yeah. and they wrapped themselves in cellophane and suffocated themselves <laughs> so yeah thank you for uh that information and anything anything that you guys hear on here that that you find isn't true and you want to straighten us out let us know or there's something we couldn't remember or craig couldn't remember and you can help us and certainly comment in the comments and we'll go over those and uh, we appreciate all the comments that you guys have and all the uh people watching the podcast and with that craig that's it on the comments so i think we can wrap up and jump into the uh the video all righty then yeah so okay well 
looky here, looky here. That was podcast number 148 of the Stone Brody Show. And see you later, alligator. At the wild crocodile. I'm doing a thesis on the Leonard Skinner band. Yeah. And from the very beginning of their roots from 1964 to October 20th, 1977. And I was told that uh, you were one of the first people um, on the scene of the crash itself. That's right. Um, I was wondering, I guess, if you could more or less kind of tell me in your, in your own words uh, how you heard about it and kind of take it from there. Like, how did you know the plane was, like, did you hear the plane itself crash, or was it just a bunch of uh, rumors going around, or uh, was it on TV, or did someone tell you? All right, hold on. Let me go in another room, and then I'll talk. Okay, sure. All right, now I can hear you a little better. Okay, oh. and um, I'm just kind of trying to piece everything together uh, exactly. Like I know, like to say why the plane crashed, but after that, it's kind of like mm, you know, um, everyone has a different story, but it's still kind of the same thing yeah. along the same lines. And if this brings up any bad memories or you don't want to talk about it, I understand, and that's fine, and we'll just cut it off right here and, and now, you know. Oh, no. It, it wasn't. I mean, it don't bother me. But when my wife told me you called, I said, no, I can't hardly remember what happened, you know, 17 years ago. Yeah, it's, it was a while ago, yeah. But uh, some of the things I do remember, you know, that you don't ever forget. I guess the way I was involved in it, a friend of mine named Stuart Hemphill saw the plane go over. He thought it was extremely low. And just a few minutes later, he saw it go back toward Macomb, which was opposite direction that it had just came came over. It was headed toward Baton Rouge, Louisiana, if I, my memory serves That's me. That's correct, yes. And we're about 65 or 70 miles from Baton Rouge. And uh, he called, when, once he saw the plane so low, he called the airport at Fernwood, which is near Macomb, and I believe they told him they had a plane in trouble in this, in this area. Mm-hmm. And uh, a few minutes later, he called back, and they said, well, the plane was down. He called me. And at the time, I lived about, only about a mile and a half from where the plane actually crashed, the way a crow flies. Okay. I went uh, to that general area, and as soon as I got uh, in that area, there was a several Mississippi Highway patrolmen. Yes. And by then, and all, about the time I got there, there was this helicopter that came over. By then, it's about dusk dark, just barely getting dark. And I remember the uh, helicopter had a huge light, and the helicopter was flying fairly low, looking for the, the wreck. I don't know if anybody told you about this helicopter. A few people have told me about it. Uh, the unsung hero in, in all this. Yeah, uh, Mr. Wall, I spoke to him last night, Gerald Mr. Wall. Wall. Yeah, he said this, the helicopter pilot, and the guy, uh, uh, one of the guardsmen was uh, drop lifted down. He said those are two of the most unsung heroes in the world because his helicopter pilot kept this, yeah, now, the, the helicopter so straight. He did. I don't remember. He, he thought somebody come off the helicopter. Yeah, someone. Uh, he, he he had a, 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 the word for it. Uh, I don't even remember anybody. Came down from a rope and someone stole his radio. Um, 
I don't even remember that. But anyhow, about the time, you know, I had on, I had stopped at the intersection of this, uh, where this road that I lived on intersects with uh, Highway 568 and uh, was standing there. And I hadn't been there for just a few minutes. You know, we could hear the helicopter and see it moving. And all of a sudden, it just stopped in midair and just hovered with its light shining down. And uh, we naturally assumed that's where it was. Yeah, okay. So we uh, jumped in our vehicle, go north on that highway, and then turn off and go down to the backside of an open pasture that belonged uh, to a dairyman named Johnny Moat. Right. Parked our vehicles and jumped out and run in the woods toward this light. And, and I'm guessing the plane at the time was about 50 or 75 yards inside this, these woods, tall trees and everything. And where it had crashed naturally made a, a little clearing. Mm -hmm. And that light was shining down through there. And, and it, it rem reminded me of something maybe you see on the TV like the Twilight Zone. Because there's there's one or two people visible hanging out the airplane. The airplane, I believe, had broken in half. So there were survivors actually hanging out of the airplane? From where the plane was broken in half. Right. Okay. And, and I'll be honest, I can't remember. It seemed like there was maybe one or two that, that were out of the plane when we got there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I climbed up on the plane where it was broken in two. It, it would be like you uh, take a, 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 a Coke can or something, and then just, if you could, just bend it and break it maybe half in two. Okay. And the top part would be open. You know, the, the where it broke would be open, and the other part would just kind of bent. And you had... If, uh, kind of two little areas you could go toward the front or toward the back. My job wound up to be right there where it was broken in two, going down in the plane and helping get the, the survivors that were still on board uh, up to that opening to some to, to Gerald Wall and his brother. And, and maybe Stuart Hemphill, who helped to kind of slide them back down uh, and get them on the ground and get them away from this wreckage, you know, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And and I remember pulling, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just six or eight people up. Uh, several of the people were conscious. The one I remember talking to the most uh, turned out to be his name was Ron, or either Ronald. Ron, like uh, Ron Eckerman. Apparently, I he he, was. he he talked quite a bit during the ordeal. Apparently, pardon. Uh, one of the I believe Mr. Wall mentioned also uh, that this Ron Eckerman. Uh, I believe his name was Ron because after all this is over, I said, well, he had the same name as Van Zandt. Right. The same first name, but I believe he was the. Uh, Tour manager? Tour manager. Yeah, that was him. Yeah. If, if I, and, and I want to think he was from Houston, Texas, but I can't remember that. If I dreamed that or if he was. But he was the most conscious. Okay. Or maybe he was hung up and it took me longer to get him out. Or he was, I think maybe he may have been the last one. He was the one most conscious, the, the furthest back, because I took him as I got to him. Right. And, oh. and I communicated with him while I was getting these others out. And I, I, I remember asking him his name and talking to him and trying to keep him conscious or, or, or motivated to talk so he wouldn't talk out. And naturally, he was in severe pain and probably, you know, almost in trauma. Right. And uh, But we had a good conversation and... Uh, 
I guess I, 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 I did this for, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes or, or longer. Just kind of like reassuring him and whatnot? Oh, yeah, yeah, getting people out of the plane. And finally we get him out. And, and we, we get them on, get them out and kind of lay them down. And the ones that were able maybe prop them up against a tree. Mm -hmm. By then, people were arriving from everywhere. The, the women had wound up and, and uh, brought some sheets and towels and such. And we were trying to make the survivors as comfortable as possible. Um, I remember one guy was his nose was almost it was just cut almost completely off and it was just kind of flopping on the side of his face mm -hmm. that was probably the worst thing i saw was uh and again you couldn't see that good you, you had we had some light but once you got out from under that light you know it, he was directly at the uh the crash on the fuselage and once you got away from that, you had very little light. Very little light, right. Okay. Out, out in the a perimeter of, of the area we were working in. There were... Uh, I believe that gentleman's name was uh, Billy Powell that you were talking about the nose. Billy Powell. That, that, that kind of rings the bell. Uh, yeah, he, he uh, in interviews with the magazines and whatnot says his nose. And he felt for his nose, and he felt for when he did feel it, it was on the side of his face. That's right, that's right. And he said, hey, 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 come, come here. And I think I remember he was propped up by a tree, and I was, well, I was in a hurry trying to do something. He grabbed my Richard's leg and said, hey, wh 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 what about my nose, man? And I looked at it, and it was, it was horrible. And I just remember telling him, don't worry. As soon as we get you to the hospital, they can throw it back on and fix you up. Don't worry. He said, oh, thank you, you know, something like that. But, uh, we got those people out, the, uh, the ones that, actually, the the, uh, the ones that were alive mm -hmm. first. And then there were probably <clears throat> about three or four that were, uh, that were already dead that we helped to get out. So you actually helped remove the uh, the the dead bodies? Yeah. Okay. yeah. We went ahead, got them out of the plane, uh, and just you know once we determined they were dead, we just took a sheet and covered them up. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly. I, I don't think anybody died after we got there. No, no one did. I think. They all those, died upon impact, too. That's right. I, I do believe that uh, those, you know, the ones that survived the crash survived. They, it wasn't, there were some of them were living. At one time that story got out, you know, that several of them were alive. And, and, but as far as I know, as soon as I got there, I looked, you could just basically tell there were two or three. You know, you could just look at them from the light of that helicopter down in that fuselage, and you could just tell they were already dead. Well, I just worked around them until I got the survivors out, and then we got them out. The pilot and co-pilot were so uh, enclosed or whatever uh, in the nose of the plane, I didn't really work with them. Mm -hmm. uh, after about, I don't know, an hour and a half or two hours, we started, or maybe quicker than that, I don't remember. We started trying to get these people to the hospital. We couldn't get ambulances to them, you know. We couldn't, we started helping them out of the woods. We got them all, you know, some of them went in ambulance, some of them went in cars uh, to the hospital. The pilot and co-pilot were so entrapped in this uh, nose, you know, of, of the plane, they wound up and had to get a, a big old tractor and some more equipment. To, it took several, several hours to free their bodies uh, from this wreckage. Uh, at some point, we got all the the survivors out, and uh, we had uh, at least three bodies 
uh, three people that, that were dead that were just laying there on the ground and the sheriff uh, decided that we needed to take them on too to Macomb. Mm -hmm. So uh, we wrapped those three up in, in some sheets and uh, I took them to Macomb to the hospital although they were dead. You you yourself took them? I, I transported them. Uh, and you don't know which which three? I really don't, but I, I think there's one. One was, one was a female? One was a female. So that would have been Cassie? Yeah, and then it was two two men, and I don't know which two it was. Um, but I do know it was not the pilot and it was not the co-pilot. Because <laughs> they were still trying to get them out or loose when I left. Okay. Uh, I'm guessing I left the crash site probably 9.30 or so uh, because I got uh, maybe quarter to 10. By then, it was people, people. Like rubberneckers, you mean, or? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, everywhere. It was cars all over that pasture. See, the police were, the, what few law was there, was involved in the rescue. you got to realize how rural this, it's not, like crashing in, in L.A. And you got to also realize this is 17 years ago. True. And we didn't have the, the medical uh, rescue type personnel and equipment that we have today, the organization that we have today. These these lawmen were involved in the rescue directly. I remember seeing, a, and there's a picture somewhere I think I've seen uh, of a lawman. I mean, his, his uniform was just stained with blood. And he was just, I saw him in the, in the hospital uh, that night, probably 10.30 when I got there. He was just completely exhausted because he had been so involved in this rescue. But bottom line, they didn't have any, uh, if the word is security, mm -hmm. get these people out or that. Uh, and there were people everywhere, I mean everywhere. And finally, you know, I guess the, the curiosity people or whatever uh, left and uh, you know I, I, they had set up a temporary morgue in one of the maintenance buildings behind the hospital and I wound up and uh, I believe took these three uh, people back there and uh, oh I just remember they were just broken all you know when we hit to move them, mm -hmm. they were just broken all to pieces. I mean, it was just like the every bone in their body was broken. I'm sure it wasn't, but it was like it was. Uh, I don't mean to dwell on on the dead bodies that were uh, like sound morbid or nothing of that nature, but uh, like, would you remember if one of them had a beard and a mustache? I, I'll be honest with you, I cannot. Remember. You just kind of blanked that out. I really can't remember. Okay. You know, I didn't spend a whole lot of time. No, obviously, no. And uh, like I say, I'm not trying to be more, but I'm just trying but to. I really, you know, I've wondered who, you know, who, who, who did I take? You know, and if I had it to do all over again, I'd, I'd be more aware, you know. But I, I wouldn't think about that, you know. Right. I, I just was trying to do what little I could mm -hmm. to, uh, to help in this situation. And you had the unfortunate job of transporting the three. Yeah. 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 Wow. But uh, I tell you, I, you may not can ever uh, get in touch with him, but but I see him on TV periodically, and I always remember his face. And it, it was so ironic to me about how things can happen and people can move this if I remember correctly, this crash happened around 7 p.m. our time. Approximately, yes, uh, 6.55. Okay, okay. I left the crash, you know, we found, I think we found the, uh, the I, I estimated we found the, the, the crash up at 7.20 or 7.25 when we found it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, I left there probably at 9, 30, 10 o'clock. We drove to Macomb, which was like 20 miles away. Stayed up there about an hour. Wind up back down here at 11.30. And, and by then, most everybody is kind of filtering out. About 
there's just a handful of, of people there. And here come four people with NBC News at 12.30, which was, if I remember, like five hours after the crash. And I, and I start talking to them, and, and I have about as many questions for them as they do for us. Right. Bottom line, they wind up interviewing me on, uh, for the national news. But the guy's name was Bob Kerr. Bob Kerr, yes, okay. K-E-R-R. -R. Right. Uh, you know, you make and somehow go through NBC. He's still with NBC News, or was in the last six months or so because every now and then I'll see him on the news and uh, and I'll say there's my guy you know I just remember him he's the one that interviewed but what I'm saying it may add to your paper if you wanted to try to trace him down through NBC News but he, he was, was in, uh, he was after the fact though correct oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. way after I mean but what, what was amazing about it was they were somewhere in Nebraska I think Oh, okay. These four people with NBC covering some kind of routine story. Mm -hmm. And when the news broke at 7.20 or 7.30, they, you know, they bought it, they changed their plans and, and flew, I think they flew into New Orleans. You see, we're 120 miles, 110 miles from New Orleans. But what the, the amazing part was, you know, they were in Nebraska, and about four or five hours later, they were in the woods in Amit County, Mississippi covering a story and I just always thought that was that's pretty amazing amazing <laughs> Bob Kerr actually I have um, I just sent away for footage uh, from both NBC and ABC. I, of course, had to pay for it. Um, uh, actual footage of the rescue and whatnot and uh, the interviewing rescue workers and... Um, I didn't realize you could buy and purchase that. Yes, you can for $140 U.S. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. That's a lot of money. As a, well... I, I would say I'd love to see it, but uh, I don't know if I want to see it $140 worth. If if uh, one of them is Bob Kerr, I could do a tape to tape and send it to you. Man, I I, I just you know. You would. Uh, I was trying to think of something else to make you tell you. Have you contacted the Enterprise Journal? Yes, I have. I talked to Mr. Dunnigan. Oh yeah, Charlie Dunnigan. Yes, and uh, he. Uh, they pretty much covered the. Is he gonna send you some of their? I have the original. Uh, October 21st paper. Yes, I, I have that original paper. Um, a friend of mine, well, not really a friend, an acquaintance of the band, a uh, former ma manager of the band, um, sold it to me. <laughs> I, and um, so I have that. And uh, I have also got, like, photocopies of days after, yeah. to the, the preceding days after, you know, um, I guess it mostly talks about how survivors are doing and um, what uh, the NTSB dude uh, gentleman was saying, what he was doing about, you know, the crash itself. And he didn't really have a whole lot to say at the time, of course, because, you know, it was so soon. Right. But uh, the Enterprise Journal, it was just amazing, actually, the coverage that they, they had. But I guess it's because it was so close, you right. know. Right. It's a pretty small town newspaper. I believe they devoted the whole front page to it this October 20th. Yes, the whole front page is devoted to the, the crash. I think, I think I still got my copy somewhere. I was trying to think of something that, that I may have. Uh, you know, I could send you. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't know who Leonard Skinner was. So you, I, as, as you were pulling the, the bodies out, you know, I had no idea. you had no idea. But I, even even worse than that, when they told me who they were. You didn't, didn't know. know. Okay. I mean, you know, that's how, whatever, backward or whatever the word is, you know, I, I've never been uh, nothing but a country music fan, and, and they didn't sing country music, and, and I just didn't know it. I had ball game on my mind. I, once we started talking to them, I said, where were you headed? And they said, that right. And I said, where are you coming from? And uh, they said, North Carolina. I think Greenville, wasn't it? Yeah, Greenville, South Carolina. South Carolina, that's right. Yeah. South, Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, there was a big game to go on Saturday in Baton Rouge. And I said, well, this is some group going to a ball game. And they said, no, we're Leonard Skinner. 
course, that didn't mean anything to me. <laughs> but uh, once we found out uh, who they were, you know, we we got interested then. And yes. And, and I scrounged through the, some of the wreckage and picked up a few postcards with uh, some of their, I, I call them postcards, decal-like things. Right. And uh, I, I kept them for you. And I, they're still here somewhere if I can find them. Oh. Uh, Let me get your name and address, and I'm going to go thumb through some of my junk. Okay. I'm going to mail you this uh, if I can find it. Might, might give you a little incentive to... Send me a tape or something. Well, I would like, like if uh, I'll send you, I'll do the tape, tape whether you're on it or not. I mean, you know, that's no. I, I'm gonna find you something. Well, tell me your name again. My name is Michael O'Hara. O H A R A. All right. My address is. One word? Yes. Alright. Alright. Ontario? O N T A R I O. Alright. Canada? Hyper C A N. C A N A. I mean, there's a break. Canada, C A N A D A. Yeah, right. I had to spell out my hand myself. <laughs> and we have post the code, not zip codes up here. Our post the code is. Correct. Alright. Uh, there was a lady from Maine. Oh, that's a lady, young that wrote me one time. Uh, she has. She was trying to get up some information. I think I still got a couple letters from her, but I don't think she ever sent me anything. Well, I have this coming next month. It takes apparently it takes uh, six weeks. It takes. Uh, I just like ordered it like two weeks ago. It takes them two weeks to find it, yeah. uh, and it takes six weeks for them to get get it all together because you know it's from 1977. It's not on videotape. Yeah. They have to transfer it from. Uh, I guess. What? tape, whatever they used back then. Yeah, they had big old huge... Yeah, big huge cameras now. 15 millimeters. Right, they have to do that. And it's got a time clock on it, so, um, you know, it tells you how many... Like, it's, it's, so you know what's the real thing from NBC and ABC. It's not like somebody, like, uh, some, some rubbernecker shot it or something. It is professionally done. It's got the time clock on it, and it was actually on the news nationwide. Yeah. And yeah, I know uh, two two of my friends happened that one would lived in uh, North Carolina, one lived in South Carolina. Happened to call me after this thing surfaced and, and had seen me on TV. So I, I do know that my my little old news clip with Bob Kerr did go evidently nationwide. Uh, I I could actually give you the number of the the library in New York City and. If if you're on it, they might even give it to you free. Who knows? Okay, just if you just hold on a sec, I can go get it. <laughs> Sorry to keep you waiting there. No okay, it's called the uh, Grinberg G R I N. B E R G. Right. Libraries Incorporated. All right. And their phone number is All right. And the gentleman I was talking to, his name was Bill Hennessy. H E N N. E S S Y. Now it's one hundred and forty dollars for me. It's a hundred dollars for the tape, and it's forty dollars for uh, Federal Express to ship it to Canada. Yeah. But if you're on it, you know, um, <laughs> I can't see any reason why they wouldn't give it to you. Yeah. Well, that'd be good if they will. Uh, I I know I'm getting both NBC and ABC. I have I've yet to find someone from CBS, but I don't know if they were there. 
I really don't either. And I really don't remember seeing ABC, but they could ABC could have come there while I was gone. But uh, I do I do know for positive NBC was there that that night. I don't know if ABC made it, you know, while I went to Macomb or just what. I think CBS just did the radio bit, to be honest with you, because I've called. Um, well, this gentleman doesn't have anything of, of CBS at all. Uh, give me your phone number if you don't mind. Okay, my phone number is... Okay, yours was one, obviously. Uh, well, my, my, I guess why my name kept surfacing. At, at the time, I was fire chief of our little rural volunteer fire department. Actually, he, uh, he told me justice of the peace, but... Yeah, I, I was justice of the peace. Oh, okay. And, and w would have been acting corner, but they handled all this in Pike County. But go ahead. And Gerald Wall, right. who at the time was a constable. That's right. And Dennis, uh, Dennis Wilson, that's you. Johnny Moat. Yeah, the, he's the dairy farmer. Yeah, I talked to him last night also. He probably made it sound a lot more uh, adventurous than I did. Uh, actually, yeah, he did, and he uh, kind of has a sense of humor about it. Yeah, I see him. Go ahead. Okay. And Dwayne Easley, who is uh, very uh, solemn about it, but very open. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he was the only person, other than yourself, that has actually described the, um, the, the fatalities. Yeah. Mr. Wall uh, really couldn't... Uh, because apparently he was on the other side or something yeah, of that, of, uh, something uh, of that nature. And Johnny Moat then, well, three people came to his farmhouse. Artemis Pyle was the drummer, and and two other road crew came to his house, and he almost shot him. Yeah, I, I think I've heard that. I wasn't directly involved in in removing the the pilot, the co-pilot. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know who actually did that. I do know it took them several hours. I mean, to, to get them out of there. I can believe it. Um, from like the only picture I have is of the uh, front page of uh, actually the front and back page of the 21st. Yeah. Uh, that's the only real pictures I have of at, right at the moment until I get the film. Yeah. Um, if and I happen to have any that I shot even a day or two after the uh, the crash, I'll try to uh, send them to you. Okay, and would you happen to, uh, this is a question I've been meaning to ask everyone, but I forgot, uh, what color was the plane? I know it's night, was night and everything, but could you... Uh, the plane, that, uh, the, what I remember, was primarily white, trimmed in blue. White, trimmed in blue. And you could, you could tell it was an older plane, even at that time, you could just tell it was a... It reminded me of, of a big old army plane, I say big... Yeah, actually, yeah, it was a little two seater. It was big, but it, it reminded me of an old army, uh, a, maybe a C one thirty that had been uh, painted and cleaned up. You know, and I, I guess it was. It was a. Uh, it, it just wasn't a, a nice modern no, aircraft. No, it was built in nineteen forty seven. Right, I didn't realize that, but uh, I mean, you could just tell that was evident about it that it wasn't. It, you could tell right away. Even <laughs> really, that's that's amazing. I mean. For, like when the plane crashed, you, I don't know, you probably couldn't smell any fuel. I really didn't. I, because I, there was only, uh, there was less than one quart of uh, fuel left. Really? I didn't know that. But, you know, somebody said, man, wouldn't you scare the fire? At the time, I never thought about it. You never thought about fire or anything of that I nature? To, I don't know whether I was that ignorant or... or just want to help. I just want to help, you know, and 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 I ain't just saying that. No. You know, we country folks down here, we'll help anybody. Right. And that's all we were trying to do was help those people because they were they were in need of help. And uh, well, I wasn't I wasn't I, I never thought about that thing blowing up or, or burning or anything. You know, not that evidently it wasn't because it wasn't no fuel on. There wasn't there wasn't enough fuel to start a a fire like a little you know a twig fire. <laughs> you couldn't well, warm you yourself up. Just uh. Just come down here and, and look around, and we'll we'll go over there. Uh, I'll take you right to it. Has uh, pretty much the same, like the trees still. I've never been back. Yeah, never been back. You know that initial that week or two. Right. You know I went back, made several trips over there. 
Right. But but it, just to say go back later, I never did. You've never gone by. But if you'll come, I'll, I'll have an excuse to... Uh, Actually, I would very much like to come because that is, you know, like where my hero died. And uh, Where'd they bury him? Jacksonville, Orange Park. Okay. Well, just, see, that's not Jacksonville, Florida? Yes. See, that's not extremely too far from here. No. I'm guessing that's only four or five hundred miles from here. Just guessing. You, you, I'm sure you looked on the map to see where we at. Yes, uh, I've been, I've known since like you know, for quite some time. Yeah. We're, 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 we're basically 100, 110 miles uh, north of New Orleans, Louisiana. Right. Right in the edge of Mississippi. Yeah. A little community called Gillsburg. It, it's on some map, uh, some of the bigger maps. But it's not on all maps. I have the the uh, Rand McNally map. I have it has on it, and it has Highway 568 on it. Okay. Well, that's it's it, it's within probably half a mile of that 568, uh, about four miles north of the little old community of Gillsburg, where 584 and 568 intersect. Okay. Probably basically due north of that intersection, about three and a half to four miles. Just about a half a mile uh, east of 568. <laughs> now, apparently, Johnny Moat was saying that uh, it was like uh, 120, 125 feet from his uh, field. That's correct. See, his field is old. He's a dairyman. Yes. He has open pastures for his cattle that he grows grass in from the east. And you can ride across that open pasture in a in a truck, you know, easy. It's grass. It's, all right. If we drove to the corner of his field and then went, I guess, across the fence in a little old creek and went in the woods to where the plane actually crashed, and it was uh, belonged to uh, what we call a lumber company, Lumberwood Industries, I believe, owned the land at the time. But it was yeah, just just off of his land. So uh, it was, I guess, safe to assume that that's what the pilot was shooting for, or I really, I just it's kind of hard to say, is it's it? It's hard to say. He could have, he could have tried to make that open field. You know, who knows? Well, apparently the 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 well, magazines and whatnot, and what I've been told, the survivors were told. Actually, the people who were in the plane were told that they were trying to make it either land on a highway or uh, open fields. Yeah, they must have been headed for that open field because he had, he, I, you know, he, he he was away from this highway uh, half a mile and and, and I'm guessing kind of not flying necessarily parallel but from where Hemphill saw him. Hemphill, if you look at a map, Hemphill lived due south of the intersection of Highway 568 and 584, if you look at it on the map, about a half a mile below that, right in, in the community of Gillsburg. Okay. This plane flew south of him, and, and he thinks went down there maybe four or five miles, and that's when evidently he had uh, decided to turn around, that he could not make it to Baton Rouge with his fuel. Right. He turned around, and he starts back north, or, or basically north, back toward the airport at Fernwood. And uh, so he, he had a chance, you know, that state highway, although it's not, you know, not the best thing in the world to land a plane, but it would have been better than out there in those oak trees. But um, I guess where I was also going to ask you, do you think it, more people would have survived or more people would have been injured had he had landed on the field at that rate of speed? And that, that I imagine he was coming in at a steep angle also. Oh. In your opinion? Like I'm, like, did do you think I've, the pine trees might have cushioned the blow a bit, or? I've made the statement before that to land the plane and and have 26 people on board and 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 keep 20 of them alive. I believe that was the figures, wasn't it? Yes, six people died, including right. the pot and co-pilot. That's right. But to keep 20 people alive out of 26, I thought he did something right. Yes, I really did. Uh, I do remember uh, the the next day or so looking at the. You could see where the plane started clipping the top of the trees, and uh, I guess what really uh, killed the, the pilot and co-pilot. He finally hit enough uh, a tree strong enough 
or he had lost enough speed to where it turned, it just stopped that plane, I guess almost dead still, and that uh, the nose just pointed straight down, and, and it's kind of coming back to me now. That nose was buried in the ground. The nose was actually buried, semi-buried? Down in the ground. I mean, it dug in the ground. Okay. Uh, and, and about, and I'm strict, again, 6, 8, 10, 12 feet high from the very nose end of it is where it broke into and it broke open and that's where I went in and so I was kind of between the uh, what I want to say the, the pilot and the co-pilot area mm -hmm. the cabin if you want is that right I was kind of between them and the, and the, at the very front of the passenger section is where and, and seemed like uh I think I made this statement, too, before the people that were killed were sitting toward the front of the plane. Right. Well, I imagine pretty much everyone was throwing yeah. forward, but... Yeah. Some of them, I think... I think old Ron... Uh, what did you say his nice name was? Ron Eckerman? Eckerman. I think he was still in his seatbelt, if I remember correctly. Uh, that we... That was part of the time we had getting him out. He was still in his seatbelt. And he may have been toward the back of the plane. Okay. He, I get. Have you had talked to him? No, I haven't. There was a guy. I think he was on the road crew. Came through, and I can't even remember his name. He came through several years after the wreck, and he was trying. To, he had been. Uh, he had uh, something like acid had just ate him up in certain places on his arms and the side of his head. Okay. He was wondering. He came back through to talk to a few people. And I can't remember his name. Was he missing an eye? He, I think he was. Gene Odom? Pardon? Was his name Gene Odom? Uh, it may have been. Because uh, he, he was burned severely. I think he, I think he did lose an eye. And he lost an eye. He, he came back to this community. And uh, again, I'm guessing a year or so after the, after, after the uh, crash. And was trying to talk to a few people and find out what chemical actually had burned him so bad, of course, we didn't have any idea. Right. That would have been Gene because he wrote a book on it. Did he? Yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, he, uh, but uh, no one published it because I don't know why. He published it himself. He sold all the copies that he could publish. Really? Yep. Huh. It's called Leonard Skinner, I'll Never Forget You. Huh. And I'd, that. I'd like to get my hands on that book. Just. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to, you know, ever be aware of that if I ever see it all. It's very hard to find, and I call bookstores in New York City and and Hollywood and and stuff like that, and they've heard of it, but they can't find it. Hmm. Hello. I'm still here. Oh, I, that, that must be your phone. I don't think it's mine. I guess it could be long distance. I don't. Know. Yeah. Um, but but we saw some money laying around in in, in amongst the wreckage. Right. And uh, I think I still uh, got the $5 bill that I picked up, but I gave a $5 bill to the, uh, I think, the Salvation Army. Or somebody was, uh, uh, we uh, during the rescue, we sent, got some refreshments or drinks or something, and I put a $5 bill in it, but I, I just kept that oven for uh, just to keep. The keepsake, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I guess there must have been, ton, like, literally, not tons, but hundreds of pounds of, of, of luggage and, and debris of that nature, personal nature, scattered about. It wasn't really, you know, uh, that much, it wasn't scattered like you think it was scattered. You know, it, it was a little bit of debris on the ground, but it, I guess it, the plane was uh, practically almost stopped before it broke open. So uh, it wasn't that much. Of course, the, I think the FAA people got some big old cranes and, uh, you know, stuff down here. When they, But by the time they moved it, about three or four days or a week later, little old stuff had fallen everywhere. You know, they had rolled it over and looked, looking for different parts of the uh, plane. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they strolled it everywhere. Now, I, uh, like I said, I was 
talking to uh, Johnny Mo yesterday, last night actually, and uh, he says that uh, you know he goes there now and then deer hunting, and he can uh, you have to look, but there's still things there. Like uh, insulation from the plane, and last summer his nephew uh, was just digging around in the dirt and pulled out um, like a six pack, you know, like a, the plastic tabs on the six pack. Really? Uh-uh. And he pulled one out, and there was one can. The bottom was gone, but the top was was still sealed. Really? The flip top was still sealed. And it was from Florida. Huh. And he said some lady came down two years ago, and in a creek, I guess it's the creek that y'all had to cross, right. um, she found part of the door. Really? Not a big part, just a little part with the door hinge. Yeah. Now, I don't know, if, like, you know, to me that could be true, but that, I would think the door with part of the hinge would be something that the FAA would really want a part of. Yeah. But they could have missed it, you know. Yeah. You take a plane broken in a lot of pieces, you know, and it was by the time they got through with it, it was more, you know, I'm sure they could have missed them, missed them, so, and I know, you know, I, and I can't remember, it, it clipped the top of those trees for, and, and I, again, I'm guessing 100 or 200 yards, and, and I know that, and it, these woods were thick, I mean, thick woods. They could have very easily missed the piece, you know. Right. So approximately how high were the trees? I would say uh, it was a big old oak trees in what we call a swamp uh, along this creek. I'm sure some of them were 60, 70, 80 feet tall. Mm. And, it, you you know, it started clipping them, and it, and it, it clipped them at an angle till, till they got low enough and the plane got slow enough till it just... Stopped, but you know, kind of stopped it and pointed it straight down, and that's when it hit the hit the dirt. Wow, wow this this is some this is some really uh, amazing things you're telling me. It's going to help me out a great deal. Oh. I'll try to to put my hands on something that that make it. Give you a little keepsake. Uh, I would like that, like you know, not to be morbid or anything of that nature. Um, but if you thought that much of them, you know, it's yeah, they, you know, like uh, I actually have a shirt of Ronnie Van Zant. Uh, apparently, this lady that used to be their publicity manager, the same lady I bought the uh, newspaper from, uh, sold me one of Ronnie's shirts yeah. from like 1972 before he was famous and before Larry Skinner was famous. But to me, Ronnie Van Zant was the heart and the soul of the band. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, once he, like, October 20th, was they died. Even though they're still around touring, um, they're not the same. So I was just like kind of wondering. Well, obviously you learned from Rod Eckerman uh, that it was Larry Skinner. Yeah. So a lot of uh, other people didn't realize. Actually, like uh, Johnny Moat didn't realize it was Larry Skinner right. until the hospital. That's right. Uh, did you tell me you you talking to him? I don't remember anybody in uniform other than. Oh, maybe two highway patrol, Mississippi highway patrolmen. Right, and he said, uh, well, according to him, him, one of them has died since then because he was a he was an older gentleman. You know, the the man I told you who was sitting in the hall that was completely exhausted. Yes. He was uh, at least fifty or, or years old at the time. You know, I think he has since died. I think his name was Sammy King. If you happen to see that name in that in that newspaper or No, no. no. But I, if I think of anything that may help you, I'll give you a call. I'd appreciate it. All right. I mean, you've done, I mean, I've got so much, I've gotten the most off you uh, that I've gotten combined out of the three other gentlemen that I've talked to. Okay. Well, I always try to be nice to people and, you know, because I want them to, uh, to help me if I was, and, and you seem to be the very most interested of anybody I've talked to over the period of 17 years. Okay. So you're not, how far are you from Toronto? Um, I'm a suburb of Toronto. So you're close. Yeah. I'll be... I, was, I was in Toronto maybe about, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. We went up there uh, 
to a World Mission Conference of the People's Church. Oh, yeah. You've ever heard of it? Yeah. The people, it's a big church there in Toronto. Yep. Yeah, we went up there for a World Mission Conference probably 10 or 12 years ago. It's a nice city in the summertime. It seemed to be nice. Uh, we, I think it was early spring when we went, maybe about May, and it's, from what I remember, the weather was pleasant. And, uh, all right about now, you don't. I don't think you'd want to be up here, but I told you up there. Uh, actually, the winter so far has been very good up till yesterday. It got down to we got uh, not Fahrenheit anymore. It's Celsius and all that crap up here. Yeah. It was minus 40 degrees Celsius with the wind chill. Good, good. Which puts it about uh, I guess minus six degrees Fahrenheit. Ugh. So it's kind of cold. Yeah. But up till yesterday, it had been, you know, quite quite a warm winter and very little snow. Like Christmas Day, we had no snow, and it's which was unusual. Very unusual. Y'all got snow now? Yeah, we got lots of snow. Yeah. <laughs> you want some snow? <laughs> no, no, no. We got lots of snow. Uh, I guess if you don't mind asking, just one final question. All right. Um. Uh. Do you like uh, have flashbacks and or if if not like like when someone mentions the crash to you, what is the like the first thing that comes to your mind? Or when you hear about the crash on TV or radio or like somebody like me calls up. I don't have any flashbacks. I've never had a problem with that. So I guess when I think of it, the first thing that that is the picture in my mind of when we got to the actual crash site and the sound of that helicopter hovering right above that tree line with that bright light on this broken fuselage that was broken half in two mm -hmm. and those those bodies or uh, I say people people not not bodies people that were what I call semi-conscious you know just kind of like in a daze or right. a trance they were awake, but not really awake, aware of where not, they were. Well, not 100% conscious of right. what they were doing or what they were saying. Right. But but just to say and help me. Help me. Please help me. Uh, that, that initial, you know, it, and again, I, I, I say it was kind of like the twilight zone because here you are at dark down in the middle of the woods, and all of a sudden there's this one little area in this forest that's lit up with a plane, you know, a big old airplane, and it broke in half in two. And it's just not a scene that you see very often. No, I guess you know? not, no. And, it, and, it, and that, that scene just just comes to, to, to my mind every time I think about it. And, and it, it's just it's just instilled uh, uh, in my brain. And I guess one day, if we live long enough, the scientists could, to, could take that picture and, and pull it out. You know, and, make, and maybe I could show other people what it looked like, but uh, right. But uh, that that stands out in my mind, and uh, you know, the people were so in need of help. You know, so in need of help, and uh, we were able to help them a little bit. And and you know, I've said uh, that for all things considered, that we did a decent job of of getting them out and not losing anybody after the crash and uh, and getting them to the hospital for, for medical help, Con also, you know, considering where they, where they were and what we had to work with. Right. I, like, I can't fathom in my mind where, how it happened, like, where, where the plane crash was and everything, but just the, the thought that nobody died after the initial impact is, is a credit to everyone, and, you know, that, that was involved from from people like you who pulled them out right on up to the, yeah. to the, the nurses and the doctors right. and the helicopter pilot. A lot of training. You know, we tried to be as calm as we possibly could right. and, and as fast as we could possibly could without endangering them any worse than they already, you know, or, or without hurting them or whatever, any worse than they already had been. Okay. Wow. And this is terrific stuff you have told me. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll dig through some of my stuff and uh, at least find you something that, uh, uh, you know, I got it here somewhere, two or three little old uh, memorabilia or, or something that that would mean a whole lot to you. I, I it would mean it would mean the world to me, and I, I can't thank you enough for 
for that and just for talking, taking the time out of your schedule to talk to me about this. Um, you know, like yesterday I got uh, quite a bit of information, but tonight it was nothing. It was nothing compared to what you gave me tonight. And uh, I can't thank you enough for that. Sure, sure. I'm glad to hear you. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Hey, Michael. Nice talking to you. Nice talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.